Well, uh, as Sarah has just mentioned, today we want to talk to you about a, a project we are developing at a school in Rio. Well, the context we're going to be dealing with is the laboratory school. It's a branch of the Federal University of Rio. Uh, it's a very interesting place to work at because it is located in a very expensive neighborhood in Rio, but it's also very diverse and democratic since we have, you know, over the past few years, you know, accomplished, you know, to insert quotas for Black, Indigenous, disabled, and low-income students. So diversity and inclusion have become core values of our institution. Well, this project we're going to be discussing with you uh, has been the result of a very particular moment in our teaching careers we were, you know, about to return to, to resume our classes, you know, during the COVID pandemic. And we, a very particular moment, because especially in Brazil, social and racial inequalities became even deeper. And we were asking ourselves, Isabelle and I, I mean, how can we get back to our old course syllabus and just ignore what is happening and just ignore the, you know, the worsening of uh, our social and racial uh, tensions in Brazil. So thinking about these issues and trying to, you know, focus on a different, um, a different approach to our teaching experience at this school, we came up with a research question, which is, how can we develop didactic materials differently? in order to foster a more decolonial and anti-racist approach to English language teaching. We could not just go back to our old, you know, course books and just ignore that race and social inequalities were becoming, you know, really worse problems during the pandemic. Well, since then we turned to two main objectives that we adopted for this project. The first objective was to promote Brazilian secondary school students' critical engagement with settled knowledge. So if they had to read a canonical author, we didn't want them just to absorb knowledge, just to absorb literary content. We wanted them to be able to detect and respond to racialized tensions in the hierarchies they were dealing with. Uh, second ob the second objective of our project was to expand the students' literary horizons and challenge Eurocentric perspectives, you know, even within so-called canonical works again, and also to spotlight English versions of native Brazilian and African folk tales. So we wanted to make them, you know, get in more frequent contact with authors that have frequently been elbowed aside in English, English language classrooms. Well, the age bracket, bracket we have been dealing with uh, are students aged from 11 to 12 and uh, studying either sixth or seventh grades. Uh, since screen time has been limited in Brazil, it's a recommendation issued by the Brazilian Society of Pediatricians we have been meeting them during the, the worst part of the pandemic for only three hours a day. The project, A Tale Never Loses in the Telling, has been implemented as a transdisciplinary project since we have had English, Portuguese, French, music, drama, visual arts and history all being taught together, sharing the same space, sharing the same uh, well, we had our own car syllabus, but we were trying to uh, implement this decolonial approach to teaching together. Uh, and we understood co-teaching, you know, this share, as a sh uh, the sharing, the distribution of responsibility among us teachers for planning, instruction, and evaluation. Well, I would like to share with you uh, some thoughts, some quotes from uh, Nigugi Wationgo's uh, Decolonizing the Mind. These two quotes particularly, they have really, you know, touched Isabelle and I. Uh, well, we were asking ourselves to what extent would our students completely agree with Nigugi Wationgo when he says that language and literature 
are taking us further and further from ourselves to other selves, from our worlds to other worlds. I mean, what we are doing in our English classes, is it helping students get in touch with themselves? Or is it just telling them, hey, you should spotlight these guys. You should read these authors. They are not like you. Their protagonists have nothing to do with you, but this is what you have to turn to. And second, we also like this quote very much, which depicts colonialism, not as a, a historical you know, chapter, but as a present moment we are living actually and it has to do with imposing not just a control of social production of wealth through military con conquest but also the control of the mental universe of the colonized then we try to explore with our students um, the this is the the cover of an atlas, we it's a, one of the first compendium compendium of maps we uh, we know of. Uh, it was published in 1570, and it's called Theatrum Orbis Theharum. And this book cover, what you can see basically, is Europe set at the very top. You see, while it it has a cross in one hand, globes right by its side, and at the bottom, what you can see in a lower level, a depiction, a figure representing Africa on the right hand side and a figure representing Asia on the left hand side. And at the very bottom, at the lowest level, these, uh, these figures, uh, the first figure on the left represents the Amerindian population, Native uh, American populations. And uh, the figure to the right represents Antarctica, I mean, the continent that was unknown, and this is why it's not complete. And when we brought this to our students, we wanted to question them to what extent this hierarchy depicted in this book cover is present to this date at school, in our English classes, and how can we change it? So talking about school as a space and talking about our English class as a colonized space, we had to tackle, you know, uh, four main challenges. First of all, we had to understand that language is a battlefield. We, when we are teaching language, we're not just, you know, teaching uh, a system. We're not changing mechanical rules. We are talking about worldviews. We're talking about ideologies. The second challenge had to do with the symmetries in our language classrooms. In Brazil, for example, uh, even though we're quite far from, you know, England and from uh, the United States, there is an undeniable focus on British and North American varieties. Third, we had to challenge uh, another view, a uh, traditional view, you know, when it comes to teaching that has to do with a, a very long tradition of epistemicide a concept that is understood as the erasure, the obliteration of knowledge produced by a given population. In this case, what we were trying to talk to our students about is how literatures and knowledge is produced by indigenous and black populations have been erased over the centuries. And fourth, we were trying to address something that is really, really um, complicated in Brazil that has to do with the myth of a racial democracy. If you ask people in Brazil about racism, there is a very pervasive belief that Brazil is not racist at all because we, our, our, the miscegenation process that we, the popula our population undertook would have you know, uh, uh, helped us you know, kind of overcome racism sooner which is a complete myth. I mean, we still have, and we all, I mean, we also have a lot of racism. It's widespread and it is in the structure of, in, on, upon which our society rests. So another author that has inspired our project is Chimamanda Adichie. When she talked about the danger of a single story I mean, we are not trying to say we're not going to teach canonical authors in our, you know, project anymore. We're not going to elbow Shakespeare aside. We're not going to forget the, all of these canonical authors. What we are trying to do is tell our students and tell parents and everyone else that we cannot focus on only one story. We need to, you know, 
uh, make room and make space for otherness. We need to make space for Black, Indigenous authors as well. And that includes the English language classroom. So what is race and what does it do? Why is it so important to talk about race when we are just teaching English? Well, first of all, as we have, uh, I have just said, you know, race has to do with language. It's not biological. It is built, you know, in society. It is built by us. It creates dichotomies. It benefits some, it marks out others. And well, this is Anya Lomba when she talks about race that even though, you know, it is not biological, it has not to do with our genes, uh, a race is not a delusion because it produces very real effects on people's lives. Isabelle, would you take over? Sure, so in order to try to decolonize our English language teaching lessons, we've drawn upon um, what Mignolo and Kumaravadivelo call a grammar of decoloniality, which invites educators who are not considered native speakers to design their own social historically oriented materials. We've also used um, the concept of critical race literacy defined by Ferreira as a set of pedagogical initiatives thoughtfully constructed to unveil racism in our classrooms. And especially during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has forced us to, to turn out to uh, online lessons, the concept of digital literacy was also paramount. And we understand it as Gilster points out as the ability to understand and use information in different formats submitting it to critical evaluation as well. And when we talk about um, our intention of trying to decolonize our English language teaching lessons, what we try to, to actually do is to decenter European epistemologies, Africanize scholarly experience, and promote critical engagement with settled knowledge as Torres Garcia has done in uh, this drawing, Inverted America. Some of the texts with, we have selected to discuss with our students were first off, um, Yeniga, the princess of Gambaga, which is an origin myth about a princess who happens to be a warrior. Boitata, which is um, a Brazilian myth about a fire serpent that looks after our environment, including the Amazon rainforest. Um, Selwi, written by uh, the actress and also author uh, Lupita Nyongo. Uh, the story of uh, Mula, as well as in the traditional poem. Um, also uh, reread by, by Oxford University Press, among many others, for example, Shakespeare's adaptations. And by the end of each semester, we have invited our students to write back to those stories, contesting them and reconfiguring the plots as they wished, maybe to uncover uh, racist dynamics, for example. Unfortunately, we, we won't be able to show you the, the entire set of materials we, we intended to talk about. But um, either way, um, some of the expected outcomes we've had were first off to make our students acknowledge that Western societies, as well as their literary and artistic works, are rooted um, in a long tradition of violence, inequality, and abstemicide. We also want them to engage critically with different literary worlds and as well as in the social world we inhabit. And by doing so, we intend to promote change, you know, and playing our roles in the construction of a more egalitarian society. If you guys want to exchange ideas with us about the materials we have produced, and the themes we, we have discussed today, we'll, we'll be glad to exchange ideas. Thank you very much.